the ants and the grasshoppers. Now, I want you to all watch this one real closely because everybody knows that ants work real hard and grasshoppers just kind of flit around when, you know, the weather's good. And the first cold snap that hits, they get a little sluggish. And the first freeze that comes along, they got no food, so they flip up their little toes and die. Okay. Whereas an ant really takes care of themselves. Let's go to our Father's Word. He always uses His creation to help us better understand how we are to serve Him, how we are to react, and so forth. So open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, and let's start with the 30th one. Proverbs 30, and let's start about verse 24. I love the Proverbs. They're just full of wisdom. If we just take a moment to meditate and to search deeper into the Word and see what it is our Father really means to convey. And if you will pay close attention to what the Father conveys to you, your life will be a lot happier because every day in Him is a good day if you have followed the path that He has set forth for you. Okay, Proverbs 30, chapter 30, verse 24. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. Now, if you're going to copy something, it's better to copy something that is wise than something that is unwise naturally. 25, the ants are a people not strong. Isn't it unusual that he would call the ants a people? The Hebrew word am, a-m, like an where we've been studying in Jose, Ami means my people, okay? Uh, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. Now, it was thought by scholars of old time that this wasn't possible and so forth, but the ants are a very interesting people, so to speak, because in a sense they do sen symbolize people because the ant and the locust, are two very important cases where God calls them a people. Example, Joel chapter 2, verse 2, the locust, which is a grasshopper. Most of you people here in this country, the old brown locust looks exactly like our brown grasshopper. Same family. But the locusts there are called a people. And you know what people are symbolic of? Satan's own best, an army of people that will come against God's people in the very end. There's a variety of ant, both in the Middle East and even down here in Texas, that store their grain. And you know what they'll do if that grain gets damp? First hot, dry day, they'll bring it up and sun it and dry it out. And then take it back down and restore it. And it is even believed by some um, biologists that certain of the ants even know how to nip the little embryo in the bud in the grain so that it won't sprout while it's in their granary. And the ants, um, they've got the old queen, much like a bee family would. And they got workers, and they got soldiers, and, and even been known to have slaves that do their bidding and keep the colony going. And they store and work, though they are small, and to say they're not strong, is, but for their size, they're very strong. And they buddy up together if something is he too heavy for one, others help carry it. And those little critters, rather than playing around like a grasshopper will all summer, uh, eating green fresh stuff like the locust does or grasshopper that's just there in the way, never any preparation. And then when the going gets rough, that's it. They've had it. But that little ant is very well organized. So we see why our Father would use the ant in contrast to the locust. Let's go a little further here, verse 26. The coonies, this would probably be better translated the rock badger, okay, are but a feeble folk, yet, they, yet make they their houses in the rocks. Boy, only a badger can dig in some of the places they go. 27. The locusts have no king. Now, now listen carefully. 
the locust or grasshopper have no king, yet go they forth, all of them, by bands and flocks. The word am, as it is used for people, for the ants, can also be translated tribe or, or whatever. <coughs> Excuse me. And here we have a contrast. What, is, what does that really mean? Now, you stop and think about it a minute. The locusts and grasshoppers have no king, but man, I mean, when they, they just like a cloud covered in the sky when they go, when they swarm. But you know what it is that usually drives them? I'll, I'll check your memory a little bit. Remember when we had the severest low of all times, a huge hurricane down here in Central America, and locusts from Africa were blowing into Central America. What drives them? The wind. In other words, they're a huge army, but what is wind symbolic of the Ruach in the Hebrew tongue? It's the spirit. In other words, God drives them where he wishes to drive them. They're like um, a ready-made chainsaw to do God's business, such as they were on the Egyptians. And God, if he so chooses, I hasten to add, can drive them wherever he so will. Now, what does that mean to you? Well, if you're a servant of God, you haven't got too much to worry about from the locusts, do you? Because he'll drive them wherever he wills, which means what, translated? He's in charge. He's in control. He can drive them away from you, or he can drive them to you, but spiritually speaking... They're not going to hurt you. You don't have to worry about them. You don't have to be concerned as long as you have the knowledge to know what your father is talking about. So what have we learned here? The ants are little, but even they store up their food. All right? They prepare. They are prepared. Therefore, they're survivors. Well, even the grasshopper survives. Yeah, God has his little ways of seeing that all his buzzsaws have a way of getting around, all right? Now, let's, let's, go let's go back in Proverbs a little bit. Let's go to the sixth one, all right? Proverbs, the sixth one, sixth chapter. And now you all know that the thing is, is God, most people, most teachers always use the grasshopper and the ant, to show the difference between lazy people and working people, all right? We've all got that. We've all heard that. Well, let's read it from God's Word, and let's get it straight. Chapter 6, verse 6, Proverbs. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. You know what a sluggard is? That's a lazy person. Go look at the ant, thou sluggard, you lazy rascal. Consider her ways and be wise. I mean, if you really have hard times and you're lazy, you can just go out to an old ant hill. Don't get too close, though. And, I mean, sometimes you have to help people and everything. <laughs> Don't get too close. But you can learn a lot watching how they survive. Verse 7. Which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, we could say leader, foreman, or a chief. And really, in a way, that old queen would kind of probably take... Uh, uh, question to that. Verse 8, provideth her meat in the summer. While, while, while it's out there to harvest, she harvests it and gathereth her food in the harvest. There's no ruler over her. It's just nature with them. It's their thing. God created certainly a little, you know, sometimes they'll have little old chapels in their dens, not, I, I mean rooms, chambers, we better call it so we don't mislead someone that according to them it'd be ten stories high and sometimes even higher in nurseries. And it's quite a colony, really, if you make a study of it. I mean, you can really learn a great deal about community living and preparation for war, for attacks, for uh, hard times, and so on and so forth. If it's in the desert in Jerusalem where it would cook one of the little rascals walking there in the middle of the day. They go underground where it's cool or here underground where it's warm, even in the wintertime. And they have a way of just picking that place where those little places can usually be kept dry. Interesting, very interesting. Verse 9, How long wilt thou sleep? Just talking to the lazy person, O sluggard. 
when wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Verse 10, Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, sitting around doing nothing. 11, So shall thy poverty, or your need, first freezing spell for the grasshopper, okay? Your poverty come as one that travaileth. It's going to be in a big hurt. And thy want as an armed man, probably better translated as a highway as a highwayman attacks a victim. Your carelessness and your lack of preparation, your lack of a little having something set aside for a for a rainy day, is going to attack you like a vicious robber. And really, that's true. So, basically, then, Larry, we got it. We we know those things and how simple it is. But do we really? Have we really found the deeper meaning? The answer is no. Not at all. If you stop there, you'd be pretty common. Because there's one thing God hates worse than a sluggard physically. And that's a sluggard that is a sluggard spiritually and mentally. Because if you were to be lazy and accept that as what God is telling you, you would miss God's true word. You would miss the beauty of the word because you were too lazy to put the gray matter to work and spiritually look deeper. What kind of food is he talking about? You know better than to think he's talking about the food in your cabinet. He's talking about the food in your brain that prepares you for a rainy day when the chief of the grasshoppers, the locust army described in Joel chapter 2, comes to this earth, whereby you have enough set aside and stored in your mind that you can withstand all things, knowing most of all God drives the locust. He's the wind that controls them, though as it is written in Joel chapter 2, they come as a strong army, never falling, never slipping, meaning they're that well organized, and they are. But you don't have to worry at all because you know that as an ant would store knowledge, food for a hard time, so you have food stored for a hard time. What's he talking about? He really wants you to make a study of this, and he doesn't want you to be spiritually lazy. And bless your hearts, don't you ever be. I know none of you are, or you would probably wouldn't be here. You'd like to look for below the surface to understand what it is your father is telling you. Now think a moment. If you really, I think it's even on our introductory tape, The Mark of the Beast, Amos chapter 6, verse 14. You go ahead and turn there. How the, God says, I'm going to bring a curse on my people. I'm going to bring a curse on Israel. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the Minor Prophets, Amos chapter 6, verse 14, and it reads there, But behold, I will raise up against you a nation. And it's that nation spoken of in Joel chapter 1, verse 6, that locust nation, the grasshopper nation. O house of Israel, saith the Lord God of hosts, and they shall afflict you from the entering in of Hemath unto the river of the wilderness, which in the Hebrew tongue is Arabia, meaning to the change, to the dusk of the day, which is to say until the end times. Now what is this word Hemath? 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55. Hemath is the father of all the Rechabites, meaning all the Kenites. In other words, the locusts, Kenite nation, the grasshopper nation. And there might be some say, well, brother, you'd have to document that a little more. Well, just stay with me. Just stay with me a minute. Let's go. Just because chapters change doesn't mean God's Word changed. Just keep reading. Chapter 7, verse 1. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me. He did what? He showed me. Brought me understanding. And behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth. 
And lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. Now, that says a great deal. Do you know what the latter days, the latter times, the latter growth usually refers to? That close of the day. As a matter of fact, this generation, he's talking about those grasshopper people of the book of Joel. He's describing that nation, that army that he would bring against you. And just for the deeper student, let me just say this. You know, I do a great deal of work in documentaries, and we go out and see old fossils and, and um, dig around in areas where it's millions of years old and see these little bitty fish and snails. And I've never found a grasshopper. I've never found a mosquito. I've never found a cricket. And it makes me wonder, why did God say, in the beginning of this earth age, I created the grasshopper to my buzz saw, all right? Maybe he didn't need him in the first earth age, all right? You got my point? I'm just throwing that in for what it's worth, department, all right? It would seem there were certain things created in this earth age that you won't find in fossils, though you will still find the snail here. It looks exactly the way it did then. You'll still find the fish here. Looks just about exactly the way it did then. No grasshoppers, all right? Just think about it. Maybe God didn't need a correction until after Satan fell and he destroyed that earth age and brought this one into being. But presto, there you got him, the grasshopper. You know what that says in the Hebrew? It says, after the king taxes you, I'm, I created the grasshopper to come along and eat up the rest of your little old goodies. You ain't going to have nothing left when my grasshoppers get through with you. But you see, grasshoppers take what they want for free. They don't really work at it. They just eat. All right. Gnaw, the gnaw gnaws, and the swarmer swarms. And, of course, I'm quoting from Joel, and you know that, the four stages of the locust. What he's saying, in the last times especially, the latter mowings, if you're not careful, that locust people will eat you alive, meaning with deception. You're not going to be able to get ahead. You're never going to be able to do like the ant, to store something up to prepare yourself mentally and spiritually to make it through. Now, let's go to the deeper level, which God wanted you to. The discussion is the grasshopper people. The subject is what God intends to do in the end times. You're there. This is important to you. Now, between the ants and the grasshoppers, let's get down to some serious study as to what God would have you know about the end times. Verse 2, And it came to pass that when they had made an end of the eating of the grass of the land, then I said, O Lord God, forgive, I beseech thee. Joel in a vision, I'm sorry, Amos in a vision saw what would happen to our people in the end times. Lord, don't let this happen to them. By whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. How can he live with that much opposition, with the lies and the deceptions of the end times upon the people? How could he ever rise back as, as a people of God? And, and bear in mind, in Christ came Jacob. I mean, Christ came through the seed of Jacob. And in Christ all things are. But, in the end times, we're taking a world that is biblically illiterate, that will not take a look deeper for the spiritual food that our Father has placed before us, prepared that table even in the presence of our enemies, if you will not be spiritually lazy, if you'll stay alert, if you'll think, if you'll use the gray matter for what God intended you to, to be wise, then you won't be caught short. And you'll be prepared simply to know. But Amos saw it. He said, don't let it happen. Verse 3, the Lord repented. He changed his mind. So I won't let him each clear up for this. It shall not be, saith the Lord. I, I, I won't let it happen. Now, you see, you want to remember our father looks at his children and he gave them, he brought them across the Red Sea and he made all the tribes of people in the beginning and set us all where we all had plenty of everything and there were no problems or anything. And man messes up. He gets tired of it. And you better know he gets tired of it by that statement. He says, I'm, I'm just going to wipe them out. No, I can't do that, he said. He repented. Verse 4, Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, the Lord God called to contend by fire. 
and it devoured the great deep and did eat up a part. God was showing him what he really wanted to do to the final mowings, the end generation. Then said I, O Lord God, cease, I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise, for he is small. The fire of deception is rampant. And there are few people that will hesitate a moment and study in depth to know what God has planned for his people's tribes and the, those he has chosen for leaders of those people. Six, the Lord repented for this. He said, I'm sorry, I won't do it. He didn't say, I'm sorry, he just said, I won't do it. All right. This also shall not be, saith the Lord God. Verse 7, Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. You know what a plumb line does? You all remember from the book of Zechariah where it describes the two... I'm sorry. Yes, the book of Zechariah where it describes the two witnesses in chapter 4. Zerubbabel, which is a Hebrew word that means barned in confusion or Babel, that came out of Babel, he's standing there with that plum bob that's got a little old bob on the end that has seven eyes in it, but it, it's the truth. It's God's Word. It's His uh, plum blob, bob, is utilized to cut a straight line. I mean, God's natural law of gravity will hold that little rascal right at the bottom of the string when you hold it here, and you got a straight line. So what it means is God is saying, I want somebody that's straight and true. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I'm going to set a true course. And, of course, that course is Christ and his word and the deep truth if you'll dig it out, if you won't be a sluggard, if you won't be lazy. I will not again pass by them anymore. I'm never going to pass by those that will what? Will look at the plumb bob, look at the plumb line, rather. Will keep true to that word. He will. What he's saying, I'm going to release the knowledge to them, the truth whereby they'll never be deceived. So there will be someone by which God can utilize among the peoples to lead, to direct, to touch, whereby the Holy Spirit can work through them. And the truth of God's Word, instead of a lot of people playing church, can accomplish the will of the Father. He said, I won't do it. I won't destroy them. As long as there will be some that will hold that plumb line. Verse 9, And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. The ten tribes of Israel that went north, uh, I'm not talking about the house of Judah, as far as 99.9% of the people that doesn't even exist because they don't even know what's going on. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Do you know what, who Jeroboam was? Do you know what the word means in the Hebrew? It means of many people, meaning... Jeroboam was the last king of Israel before it was taken into captivity by Syria and it ceased to exist after that because most people don't know where it went after the captivity. I'm not talking about Nebuchadnezzar's captivity. I'm talking about the Assyrian captivity. And what it's it's directing to that people, to that nation. Because he just said in verse 14 of that sixth chapter, I'm going to bring something upon you And it's going to be a curse until the very end of time, the grasshopper people. Then Amaziah. Really, it's a pretty good name, which means to you Christians, you better wake up. It means the strength of God, the strength of Yahweh, the priest of Bethel. Bethel meaning the house of God. Oh, you've got a set of credentials like that, friend, you're set. You've got a DD and a DDT and DDT for everything. And probably got DT. I think that's what they call it, all right? Sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. In other words, you've always got these preachers, if somebody tries to bring along the truth, that kind of rocks their boat, because probably you're already plowing so deep that they can't see the bottom of the furrow anyway, meaning you're over their head also, and it causes their people to ask questions. It embarrasses them. And that's fine. That's good. Because it'll make them dig too, you see. But you got this would-be priest that claims to be from the house of God. That's what Bethel means. And he's telling the king of Israel, throw that Amos out. Amos has just been talking directly to God. 
Amaziah hasn't. He's been talking from his own little greed. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by... Uh, this is this false priest still talking to the king of Israel. O Amos said, Jeroboam, the king of Israel, shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Okay? Uh, Amos uh, uh, had talked to the father, and the seer in captivity had been brought up, and so forth. Also Amaziah saith unto Amos, O thou seer, go flee thee away into the, house, uh, to the land of Judah. You go down there to the house of Judah and give this stuff to them. And, and there eat bread. Make your living down there. And prophesy there. You know what Amos said to him? By prophecy, but rather, I'm sorry, the false priest still talking, but prophesy not again anymore at Bethel. You stay out of the house of God with that truth. Okay. For it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. Well, now, it's according to which king you're talking about. Do you see the deception that's worked in there if you're not real careful? Now, there's a false king coming, and he's known instead of, Je uh, instead of Jesus. And there's the true king. But the bottom line is this. Bethel is never any king's house other than the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Bethel means the house of God, and there's only one ruler of that house, and that's Almighty God himself, not some earthly king. Then answered Amos, and he said to Amaziah, I was no prophet... Neither was I a prophet's son, but I was an herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. In the Hebrew, it says wild figs. Now, how it got to be sycamore, I don't know, but that's one of the reasons the translators of the King James wrote you a letter in the original copy. That they were doing their best, but really it means wild figs. You know what figs do at harvest time, and you all know the parable of the fig tree. Jesus didn't say, maybe you should learn the parable of the fig tree. He said, learn it, and you won't be deceived. Now, this has to do with it. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, go prophesy unto my people Israel. What Amos is really saying here is, hey, look, I don't make my living as a prophet. I don't have anything to do with prophet. I wasn't raised a priest, but I'm out here herding my sheep and gathering the summer fruit. And God told me to come and say this. I didn't come and say it on my own, and I didn't come to say it for money. Now, holding that plumb blob is a lot like sounding that trumpet of uh, Joel chapter 2. To hold that plumb line of truth out to the world, and you'll never be destroyed. You'll always be blessed. Remember that well. You'll always be blessed. Remember that well. Never as the ant people in storing away your own preservation in hard times. Help hold the plumb line. Help sound the trumpet. That's to say God's Word, not my Word, not your Word, not somebody else's Word, but God's Word to the peoples of this world. And God will never destroy you, nor will He take away from you. Now, that's real simple. And you're, you're looking at a congregation that's a prime example of it, a little church in northwest Arkansas that dared say we will teach God's truth and nothing else as best we can. And he has helped that truth to where now we even go around the world. Not planned that way. Didn't even really ever even think about it seriously. But we're still there. And it's because we're going to hold that line and we're going to sound that alarm that there is a locust people and that God's people spiritually are never lazy. God hates someone that's spiritually lazy more than he does somebody that's physically lazy. And don't you ever forget it. If you want your little old blessings just pulled out from under you like a little old rug, you just get lazy spiritually on him. You just forget that he's your father and that he wants you to tell him, Father, I love you. I care. I need you. And I want to learn of your word. I want to be wise in it. And his blessings will start showering around you. But he would come near. You listen to me. He would probably come near if you have the ability. He would come near blessing someone that was physically lazy. And he would somebody that worked their hands to the core and was a sluggard in the spirit. Lazy in the spirit. Because you would miss these gleanings that we're about to draw from here.
concerning this generation and that buzzsaw he has provided for those that will not pay attention. Amos said, I didn't ask to do this. Okay? And he continues. And the Lord, verse 15, And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. He's done the same thing to many of you, touching you and giving you the unction that there was more to his word and you needed to seek it out. Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord, thou say, uh, uh, thou or you sayest, prophesy not uh, against Israel, and drop not the, thy word against the house of Isaac. And there was Amos saying, it wasn't my word, it's God's word. Therefore thus saith the Lord, thy wife shall be an harlot in the city. What city? Babylon, the city of confusion, referring to the end times. And thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword. And thy land shall be divided by line. What line? The plumb line, if you want to know the truth of it. Because those on the plumb line will be safe and secure. And those that are divided on each side of it will be deceived, fall, unprepared. And thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of this land. They did, but that was only light compared to what's about to happen. As far as deception is concerned, I'm not talking about war. For there is a famine for putting food away in this end time. And do you know what the locust people do? Let's just take a minute and read on. This concerns you, and this is the end time. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. Do you know what that means, beloved? Summer fruit means really ripe fruit. It's got to be picked right now, meaning the harvest, meaning the last days of this earth age, the latter mowings. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a basket of summer fruit, ripe fruit. Then, then said um, the Lord unto me, The end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not pass by them any more. They're ripe for what? Picking? Not in this case. If you're not on that plumb line, ripe for chastisement. Ripe to be whipped into shape and made ready for a millennium age. And the songs of the temple shall be, the temple is the church. The songs of the church shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies. That means spiritually dead, lazy dead spirits, too lazy to think and come alive. In every place they shall cast them forth with silence as a hush, as though it's something very religious. They'll be cast forth by the great deceptor himself as they fall on his trot, uh, trot line. Four, yeah. hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land fail. You listen to me, you grasshoppers, saying, When will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn? When will their religious day go by that we can rip them off again? And the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small, making their bushel a lot smaller than what it is, but still charging them a whole bushel. And the shekel great, little inflation to their old dollar, and falsifying the balances, tipping the scales just a little bit, heavy-thumbed, uh, they call it, by deceit. Verse 6. Does this sound familiar to any of you all? I, I know it doesn't, but just bear with me, okay? I mean, you've got to be a pretty sharp if you're going to be successful today, all right? You've got to be more like the ant. And no, there are grasshoppers around that will bless you and say, oh, let me help you. Let me help you weigh that. <laughs> all right. Okay. That we may buy the poor for silver, that we can put them in slavery actually because of interest payments maybe. And the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the, of the wheat. We could even sell them that old molded part of the wheat that's not fit for anything. They'll buy it. The Lord has sworn... Now remember, beloved, we're speaking on a much higher level than molded wheat. Do you know what kind of molded wheat he's talking about? It's when you go to Bethel and um, you've got an Amaziah up in the pulpit... And he puts out stuff that's molded, not from God's Word, but from traditions of men. You'll buy it. They'll believe it. Do you understand? You stay with me. 
The Lord has sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. He said, I got a little book, and I'm keeping records on everyone. Quite frankly, beloved, it's called the book of life. And there are a lot of people that think they are ever so intelligent and are in the ways of the world that are about to be blotted out of the book of life. Shall not the, hand, shall not the land tremble for this, and every one mourn that dwelleth therein, and it shall... Rise up holy as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. You all know the flood that Satan brings in his final conquering in Revelation chapter 12. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, and beloved, you can believe it, this is that day, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. In other words, times are going to be changed and people will be deceived. And I will turn your feasts into mourning, no more social parties, and all your songs into lamentation, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head, and I will make it as the mourning of an only son. Be careful which son you mourn for, that's what he's saying. There's a false one, and there's a true one, and the end thereof as a bitter day. Now, here is your warning. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Are you an ant? Can you gather up food? Not a famine for bre of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. That's what you must store, my friend, and that's what it means, be like the ant. And don't ever be caught as a sluggard spiritually or mentally. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from north even to the east. That's all around the compass. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. I hate to say it, beloved, and I'm not talking down to our brethren or anything, but how many churches do you go to that are filled with something other than a one-verse Charlie? Now, now think about it. That's not something we can smile about or laugh about. But the churches of our land are filled basically with one verse Charlie's, one verse from our Father, and then an hour of their own traditions. And they mean well. I love them. They're our brothers. But how much better off they would be if they taught the Word of God for the full hour? Then the famine would not be so great that people could love him and understand that God will protect you if you'll believe, and if you will go to His Word rather than man's Word. It's that simple. Be an ant and store that that prepares you for the famine that is here already. That is to say, study your Father's Word. Go into depth. Don't If you're, if you're spiritually or mentally lazy, forget it. You're not going to get there lest the Holy Spirit touch you. And that's why it's referred in the sixth chapter of Proverbs there, sleep on, sleep on, sleep on. Didn't have so much to do with being physically lazy, but someone in a stupor of sleep that can't open their eyes to see the truth of what's happening in this world. Okay? Verse 13, In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst, not for water, but for truth. They that swear by the sin of Samaria. You know what the sin of Samaria was? It made two golden calves and worshipped them instead of God. That's what the Jeroboam's people did just before they went into captivity. And say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth in the manner of Beersheba. That's where they worshipped the two calves, liveth. Even they shall fall and never rise up. Again, false religions are going to fall by the wayside. By false religions, I mean those that will not teach their Father's Word rather than their own. Because there is a king returning to this earth. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There are many things that shall happen between now and that time. It's going to happen to you. How is your little old den stocked? The harvest is ripe. 
hustle and bring in spiritual food into your chambers of your mind whereby you can stand and never be ashamed because your mind and your granaries of your mind will be filled with the living word and every day in him is a wonderful day because his wind blows the locust away from you when you have your grain full and it is anointed by the Holy Spirit. You never need fear to come near you. There are no giants in this world. If you will wake up spiritually and respect your Father for the beauty and the completeness and the love that is found no other place in the world except his word let us pray heavenly father we thank you father for your word thank you for being our father we love you so very much use this congregation father it's a pleasure to us to be a servant of thine we ask it in yeshua jesus precious name amen